stuck in the middle. I'm stuck in the middle. Each of you guys hear me. Half my mic, half your mic. Right. We really got to figure this out. And a bigger table. We need a bigger table. We need headsets. We need headsets. We need uh, recliners. And we're going to need a midget. Gonna, oh my god. I'm going to need you to subsidize that. It's been a uh, busy morning, guys. <laughs> yeah. A lot of good things. All right, Brian, we ready? All right, we're recording. All right, we are live podcasting on the Lift Lab Strength and Philosophy Podcast Special Edition, extra long, brought to you by Kill Cliff and our good friend T Fox sixty six at Nike Weightlifting. You can get a hold of him on the Instagrams, or you can check out AthletePerformanceSolution.com for all of your Nike weightlifting apparel. He has also told me that you will be getting a discount code here soon. Discount codes. All right, so I got the promo out of the way. We can get straight down to business. All right, today we are going to be reviewing, critiquing, slash whatever the Icarus documentary. And I'm not talking about the Agent Greek version. I am joined today by Danger Man and Jess who is now, because this is his second podcast, the mainstay. So, all right. He needs like a side boost. I'm going to stop saying so. So, basically. Here's what's on the docket. Um, When you start listening to a podcast, your attention has to automatically be captured within the first basically two minutes, or you're going to stop listening. And I am very fearful that with this in-depth background I'm about to give, we might lose a viewer or two. Only got 30 seconds. I'm, I'm going, going fast. fast. Remember the seven minute muscle and fitness like yeah. rant you went on? See, that was good. This, one. Is, this is probably going to be better. Uh, okay. So listen. All right. I have been waiting five years now to do something with that unfinished dissertation for my PhD. And I, sorry, sprayed on me there. Just, just spit a little. Spit a little. Yes. Spittle. I'm excited. I start to spit. Um, and I had a dissertation that was a cross-cultural analysis between Eastern Europe, i.e. Russia, China, and the United States, and the things that were going on socioeconomically, culturally, in their prospective countries at their time of Olympic sport prowess. Okay, so what was happening that was making them good or what was happening that was making them bad? And just recently, um, oh, and the reason I never finished, okay, okay, the reason we're in an ABD phase. I think it's out of principle at this point. <laughs> right, it is out of, it, no, it's out of spite. It's out of Two spite. different things. Okay. Uh, the reason it is unfinished is because I spent 30,000 words just trying to frame up uh, basically cultural aspects of things that were going on before I could even get to uh, the actual sport and Olympics and shit that was, that was uh, taking place in terms of wins and losses and medals and the whole thing. So it basically would have been a paper so like so incredibly focused that no one would read it. Yeah. Okay. And so incredibly long that it would, have, it would have had to be a book, which isn't necessarily bad, it's just long. And my advisor was... Um, he was like, look, if you're going to get out of here anytime <laughs> soon, you're going to have to change your topic or whittle it down or, or whatever. And I, I was like, okay, you know, let me think about that. No, nah, I'm just quit. <laughs> so <laughs> whittle it down. And <laughs> I'll, I'll whittle it down to I'm out of here. Um, and, but this documentary just aired on Netflix called Icarus. And it was, its goal was to expose uh, the doping scandal that occurred and led to the banishment of Russia from the 2016 Olympics. And what I want to do for you is I kind of want to give you a little bit broader perspective on what was going on, okay? Um, and I want to lay some background and talk about talk, talk about the documentary from an artistic standpoint um, and kind of give you know some critiques and things like that, as well as uh, bounce some ideas off Dan and Jess. I know specifically rowing was mentioned in the documentary. It was. Weightlifting demonstrated like this by Grigory was 
Then it was in Riggery. <laughs> yeah. And uh, football, which is, so, you know, actually soccer, as we say in American, um, was mentioned in it as well. So basically, we're going to get to talk at some point. No, just, no, 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 okay. no, no, this is my thing, don't take it from me. I, this is, this is I, your moment. Well, I, I would like to just point out via YouTube that I told these guys to come prepared with notes. And as you can see, I'm holding this up on YouTube's. There's a lot of color and scribbling. That is notes. And the collective sum of these two guys' <laughs> notes is nothing. I was All right. So one of us, a week ago, when I was like, hey, this is what our podcast is going to be about. Make sure you do your homework. Watch your movies. We whatever. watched it. Yeah. Which, which was the homework. I said, take notes. You know, somebody's got to be prepared. And uh, anyway, they didn't listen. So... Let's get down to the business, and like anything, Dan, do you know the story of Icarus? Jess, do you know the story of Icarus? I'm talking about the Greek mythology. About the Greek, the Greek mythology, which this film is named after. Do you, uh, are you aware of kind of the ins and outs of it? Pretty much a father and son build wings out of wax to fly. And the father tells his son not to fly too close to the sun because the wings will melt. And being like any kid, doesn't listen to their parents the first time. Flies too close to the sun, ma- uh, the wax melts, falls to his death. All right, so Jess, he and you are he partially there. Okay, let me give you a little more depth because this is what I've been waiting on. All right, so with the story of Icarus, everything that Jess told you is completely accurate. But what they were escaping was Icarus's father actually constructed the labyrinth, which was constructed to contain the Minotaur. Now, first point of interjection. The Minotaur, half man, half bull. We, there's got to be some gene doping in there, right? <laughs> you don't just get that. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty lucky. Yeah. Are we talking labyrinth like the David Bowie movie from 1986? We will never mention David Bowie on this podcast. We already did. No, he's this <laughs> done. Uh, but okay. yes, and Jess, you are correct. His father warns him first of complacency. And then he warns him later of hubris. And obviously hubris gets the best of him. Splat into the sea. You can either assume that he died on impact from such a height or he drowned. Anyway. But I thought that was actually a really uh, clever title. It was. Just from an, an artistic, very artistic background. Okay, so let's. <sighs> Glad I got to get that out of the way. I am so Check. excited about this podcast. Check. Oh my gosh, we got to talk about gene doping, Icarus, Hubris, Minotaurs, Minotaurs, David Bowie, David Bowie, <laughs> and that's your first seven minutes of the podcast. Okay, now moving along, just getting into the X's and O's and the structure uh, of the documentary. We all agreed that the documentary was really two different things, okay? So it starts out with Brian, who is the, the producer of the uh, documentary, and it leads you to believe that the documentary is solely going to be about him beating a drug test. So they start framing it up with American voices, i.e. Uh, Marion Jones, Lance Armstrong, I'm pretty sure some baseball guys on there talking about how they never tested positive and they never doped in Oprah and all kinds of shit, right? Uh, and Brian basically lays the, the found work for this grand experiment he's going to do to himself. Right. He's a cyclist, right? And not a shitty one. And, and like not a bad one. He's, and he's uh, trying to win a race in France. The Hout Route. Right, the Hout Route. Yeah, which is the hardest stages of the Tour de France. Combined in like one week. So he goes, year one, finishes 14, yeah, I, guess. I believe. Yeah. Which he, is pretty good. And just expresses how there are dudes that are just on another level than where mm-hmm. he's at. They're just hammering it out. And he he first contacts uh, Don Kaplan. Yeah. From the hey, LA lab. From the, from the UCLA, what well, used to be the Water Laboratory. I'm not actually sure if that one's still going. It could be. Probably not after this uh, documentary. Yeah, not after this documentary. But uh, Don kind of basically agrees to help him out. And his, his uh, Brian's social experiment is basically, can he dope 
and pass a WADA drug test. That's kind of what he sets out to do. Don basically gets cold feet on it, says, you know what, Brian, I, I love the fact that uh, you're trying to do this, but I can't help you out. However, I know somebody that may be able to help you out. The old referral man. Enter Gregory. I, Enter Gregory. I do think it's important to note that Don did create many of the methods to catch people that dope. Yes. So again, if he taught Brian how to beat those, he would technically put himself in you know, jeopardy. So that's why he gets cold feet. But His reputation was on the line. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then this brings us into Grigory, and Grigory uh, is, he is an interesting character to say the least. We'll talk about him later on as a man, as a person, just, you know, let alone, or sorry, um, irregardless of his actions and kind of some of the things that were, that were interesting about him. Um, but he is, Dan, how would you describe him? He, he describes himself as like the mastermind slash the mafia at one point. He actually references himself as, you know, uh, a, a minister with some sort of salvation. Yeah, he's, he just seems like the mad scientist, right, where he's just like in so deep and like he believes so much, like, like in what he's doing and that like, you know, like not what he's doing is wrong, but it just is his, you know, task that he must do. Sure. And just so everybody understands, Gregory is the, basically the, he's on the water board. And for the Sochi Olympics, he's going to be the last fail safe, the last person to handle the, the samples in the water lab that's set up in Moscow. Okay, so he, he would be the man. All right, and basically, the documentary is going to show you about how Russia cheated the process. Okay. Um, well, let's go ahead and get into that first. So, just the X's and O of how how Russia cheated the process. Grigory was invited over to the U.S. by Don in the late '80s. Okay, and the U.S. did this as an invitation to kind of welcome the Soviets, ease the Cold War, and give them an idea of essentially like a friendly invite over to the U.S. to play how to test your athletes. And Russia was even able to bring some of their athletes over for some just experiments run out of the UCLA lab. So Gregory got to see how the lab was run, how they basically took the test, how they did the test. And he was also able to know, without any consequence, of these athletes that he selected, which of them were doping. And this is like an interesting point in the documentary that doesn't really get brought out that much, but it gave him the opportunity to see if what he was doing was beating the test. He does mention at one point that he himself did um, do steroids because... He himself was like an aspiring track star, and the only way to get to the national team was to inject, and he even talks about his mom injecting him. So that's kind of like where he started and got his, you know, love for sports and, you know, biochemistry, if you want to call it that. Absolutely. And I mean, there's a point in there where he talks about him uh, developing the test for the metabolites mm -hmm. once they were, weren't able to be clean, be clean samples of stanozole, yes. is, is that correct? Right, so he uh, developed a lot of the testing that uh, tests for the half-life of those metabolites after you know, like a certain year when they stopped getting them from China, I believe. Yes, so that's, that's Gregory's introduction basically to the U.S. and to how WADA uh, doping and testing is controlled for. And then he basically spends the next however many years, 89 until uh, 2015 or whatever when they got busted, um, in Russia as the head of, uh, head of their doping control. Okay, so he knows, and now he has an inside seat to everything that WADA's doing because he's a representative of WADA, right? He's essentially at the highest level, so he always knows what tests are coming and, and how it's going to be done. This leads us kind of, if we're walking through the documentary, into his introduction to Brian, okay? And they meet via Skype in which Gregory, or Gregory, sorry, it's getting 
fucked by his dog. Okay, and that enters <laughs> that enters into the character that is Gregory, and the man is absolutely hilarious. I don't know if it's just because he's into doping, if he's into testes and what they produce or whatnot, but every dog that he comes in contact with licks his toes and humps his leg. And that's like a pretty a pretty constant throughout the documentary. And he loves it. And he thinks and he he's he just a, thinks that that dog has nuts. It's the best thing ever. He is a huge dog lover. Um, so when he when he meets with Brian, he basically is going to sit down and set up a doping schedule. And they don't get into all the ins and outs of how it's procured, um, what they're doing. And so I wanted to lay some of that out for you. First of all, Brian got his drugs from a with a prescription from an anti-aging doctor in the U.S. Or uh, yes, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I, I, do we ever know he was from L.A. Right? Yes, he was. Yes. And so we can we will just make wild assumptions here that these kind of places exist all over L.A. I don't know if they do or not. Um, but the the doctor is giving him uh, HCG test and eventually EPO. Um, and those are basically the, the banned substances that are going to help Brian train day after day. And it's going to help with his oxygen uptake. And I believe, I, I don't 100% know this, but the HGC is more or less for his, to keep his um, normal testicular production up. I.e. so he can have kids, per se, if he wanted to. Am I correct on this, Jess? I would assume so. You're one of the young guys <laughs> in, the, in the know. I'm, so, um, you know, I... Big thing to point out is like this is a systematic doping, Correct. Thing, right? So like when we talk about systematic doping, this is on a schedule. You have a regimen of uh, drugs you take. It is you know, like he takes like a few CCs a day total. Yes. yes. Right. It's yes. not the guy who injects you know twenty CCs into his leg and wonders why he has a hole in his leg all of a sudden. Right. right. That is not systematic doping. Well, and so they're doing it for two reasons. Um, in the documentary, there, there, there's a lot of frozen piss in the documentary. There, there's okay, time. so Brian is taking these micro doses. He's taking small injections every day of testosterone and uh, HCG. You know, like I said, eventually EPO, and all along the course of him doping, he's taking urine samples. And the whole point of those urine samples is not to prove whether or not he was doping. Obviously, we know that he's doping, is to test the levels of the metabolites that's in his urine. Okay, so if they know if they know um, the level of metabolites, they can know how many days they would have to stop doping before an event to actually pass the test. Okay, so what they're what they're rolling the dice on is that uh, Rusada, uh, which is the Russia's version of USADA, it's just the Russian anti-doping agency versus the U.S anti-doping agency, uh, is not going to test them when they are out of competition. This is a stark difference from what goes on in the U.S. Very. Okay? Um, and so if it calls into play two things. One, Grigory is looking for the purity of the product. He mentions when China was producing this shit at mass scale, the quality of the, of the product, i.e. the banned substance, was very high. Therefore, the metabolites would have a much more consistent schedule for being in your system. All right, the U.S. demanded that China back down its production of basically steroids because it was infiltrating every sport. When that happened, they lost some of their quality control in terms of being able to, to determine the half-life or the length at which the steroids stay in your system. So basically went from a nice facility to this is your bathtub steroids. Exactly. Basement trend. Right? Yeah, making trend in your mom's kitchen, right? Yep. Which is the current state of doping in the U.S. It's actually right. really easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, do not do that, by the way. So it, but in the documentary, that that's essentially, it, it's almost where we get cut off, okay? And that's kind of, this would be my criticism of the documentary. When... It starts out, Brian is just trying to pass this test, okay? And so they're freezing urine. He takes urine back to, to Russia, to the Moscow lab. He goes into all the intricacies of how he's coding the urine, okay? So if he gets caught with his urine on the plane, he needs to have, like, some sort of plausible solution. And plausible deniability is going to be a big part of this whole thing. But he needs some plausible solution as to why he's flying from the U.S. to Moscow 
with 30 containers of piss. All right? Why do you got this frozen piss, Mr. Gregory? I don't know. I want to know what my protein balance is after breakfast. So Gregory codes the urine based on the day. He basically puts like, you know, February 28th, Gregory AM after breakfast. And that, you know, it, it, it's not the actual date, you know. So he has a separate code on a sheet of paper that essentially he'll go back in and decode to learn where Brian was at in all stages of his doping. Uh, so they do that. Uh, they essentially, and this is kind of where the documentary shifts. All right. Brian, at this point, Brian does his race and it's very anticlimactic. He breaks a derailleur on his bike and ends up doing worse and finishes worse than he did the year before. However, uh, leading up to that, his testing on the bike was like he doubled his wattage output, yeah. his um, his VO2 max like went. I mean, just like everything improved. And you can only assume that had he not like lost a derailleur and basically a whole day of riding, that he would not have done worse than he did the year before. Okay. Now, that's where the old documentary to me kind of takes a sharp turn and goes back and goes towards um, something that is a little more. I don't know, impactful to the actual subject matter. Yeah, right. and I think a big point to note is that when he gets to that first year, like, basically, like, you know, he's, like, in a bad spot, but gets kind of reassured that he's going to, he's, like, really going to go through another year or two before he really sees a result. For Brian. Yeah, like, uh, for Brian. So, I mean, like, they, they basically, we're gonna, they basically scratched the surface. And yes, 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 yes. So, yes. like, we're... We're gonna go next level. That's an excellent point. So, like in the system, he's only been in that systematic approach for one year. Right. So, if you think of what you know, like uh, Gregory's been doing what for, you know, 15, 16 years in right. Russia, right? I mean, he knows like the levels at which you have to go through. Right. So he's trying to reassure this guy, hey, it's fine. You know, we got through your baby stages of systematic doping. He is basically baseline data. Is yeah. what they did. They're just like, here's our starting point. We Compared know this. it to being in a building. He's like, you're only in the basement. Yeah, exactly. You gotta go to the bottom. That, that's exactly, exactly. And right. then also to mention the Hope race or the Hope route, the race that Brian's in, they don't actually have a drug test policy. So that's why he was able to do this. Like sure. they mentioned, he like did a little bit of research on it. So there is no drug testing. It's just that he wants to see like what he can do after his like genetic potential if he's even reached it. So Absolutely. So at that point, picking back up chronologically, kind of through the documentary, uh, it shifts towards the investigation of Russia and Gregory and the, the whole shebang. Now, here's where I'd like to take a brief pause in the action and recommend another documentary for you to watch. There is uh, a documentary called uh, How Russia Wins Its Medals. Make sure I got that right. Yes, it's on my note checks here. Um, or how Russia makes its winners, sorry. And it was a German documentary. If you Google it, you will be able to find it. It's all in subtitles, so you have to read while you watch the documentary. It is hands down better than Icarus. And it's only a, roughly an hour long. It was made in 2014? In the 15. Of, it had to have been right after Sochi, right? No, it was, I believe, in the lead up to Sochi because Gregory then tells Brian to watch the documentary about him. He's like, did you see my got movie? It, got it. And yeah. then Brian goes on about it, and that's where they're like, hey, we should actually expose this versus, like, Brian being in the lab saying, like, how do they do it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a call to action. Sure. Right there somewhere in the, like in the beginning. Uh, if you watch that, um, the, the, what I'll call the original documentary, How Russia Makes Its Winners, it lays, it just gets straight to the, to the meat and potatoes of how they, past tests, and Gregory's mentioned in it as basically a, a dual role. He either systematically dopes you to the point where you pass, or he orchestrates bribes after a failed test. Um, and this is not too terribly uncommon from stuff we've seen recent, recently or present day. Um, you'll notice that there were some Russian weightlifters that didn't show for the world championships where they were going to be tested on U.S. soil, right? The tests were going to be formed by USADA, okay? 
Russia was made aware of that before they came over. The uh, I believe, and this could be a little, this could be off a hair, but I believe that typically WADA handles the IWF World Championships testing, but there's no reason why USADA couldn't. And uh, Phil Andrews, president of the USA Whale Team, said USADA's, USADA is going to handle the testing for this event. Russia pulled some athletes. The, the conversation was they were tested back home. They weren't going to pass the, the USADA test, so they just didn't send them. And that was for 2015. Versus risking getting them suspended for the Olympics in 2016. Which ended up happening anyway, I believe, with the 2015 with the super with Lochev. With Lochev. Yeah, right. some of them still right. tested so positive. Some of them still tested yeah. positive. Um, mean. So, and it, like, you know, the story ends with Russia getting banned, you know, ultimately. Okay, but the story that, that, had to come out had to be so it's hard to say beyond reasonable doubt because one of the main themes of the whole documentary and all of doping in general is this like idea of plausible deniability okay and the entire russian system was set up with some level of plausible deniability okay lance armstrong in the very beginning of icarus and you know he's just famously said with uh extraordinary Accusation or extraordinary accusations must be backed by extraordinary proof, right? So there's kind of like in this doping world, where it's like a smoke screen being set up to, you know, hide what's being done. Okay, so a level of plausible deniability would be, why would the head of WADA cheat, right? Or you know something like that. Well, you know, because he was given six hundred thousand dollars, like you know, but that's why. So. There's always like a level of plausible deniability coming out of Russia, and that's one of the things that like Gregory gets into um, pretty thoroughly. And he talks about cheating and whether or not he's like once you once you start lying, you can't just tell half a lie. You got to tell the whole lie. I think he called like fifty percent lie or something like that. He's like you keep lying until the very end, right? Uh, so on the the technical aspects of it. We'll just get through real quick the X's and O's of them. Uh, Russia basically decides, okay, we're going to systematically dope these athletes so that we can pass the test. Then, or supposedly, uh, under the instruction of Putin, <laughs> fuck that. Right. We're just, we're just going to dope. We're just going to dope. We're going to dope through the damn games, and we're just going to send a KGB, and we're going to destroy piss. Now, it's if you say it like out loud, it's amazing. Like, how much attention is placed on people's piss? Right? It's, it's pretty high. It's like I mean, like little frozen jars. Yeah, pretty much everywhere. So this is what they did: they stockpiled piss, clean piss, and with the with the water testing, the the bottle. They basically go into these Adams bottles that are essentially bottles you can't just unscrew the top. You have to have a specific specific machine to take the top off the bottle or else like right. And you can't out. put it back on. And you can't put it back on. Okay, so there is this is like supposedly the the once a urine's in the bottle, it ain't coming out. Unless the KGB gets involved. And what they did was Gregory had to stay late in the lab. And he had, obviously, the highest access to the lab in Russia because, you know, that's his home. On the compound where the lab was, they had a building that was staffed or manned by the KGB. And after everyone had left, the Russian athletes who they knew were going to test dirty, KGB guy would sneak over. Fresh Adams bottles and uh, fresh piss. They basically would take the or unscrew the tops with some machine, dump the piss down the drain, put the clean piss, swish in. it around, wash it out, clean piss in. Okay, so they never actually tested positive because they probably got the piss from you know a school teacher down the road or, or some other some other aspect like that. So that was that was actually how they. Passed the test. It wasn't something where they like they beat it with a systematic 
with a systematic like microdosing approach. They just used clean piss. Okay. Now, compare that to what Lance Armstrong did. How did Lance Armstrong pass so many doping allegations and so many doping tests? Well, because Lance Armstrong with EPO, they tested it with blood. Lance Armstrong had an RV traveling with him in the Alps. Okay. When he was going to get tested, they stalled. He locked himself in that RV. He had a guy on staff that would do a blood transfusion. Not risky at all. Right. On the risk scale of 1 to 10, 10 being dumb, it scored a 20. Right? Like, let's see if we can just, just switch out your blood real quick. You know, in an RV, in the Alps, in 10 minutes. Think you can do that, Lance? Yeah. The amazing part is he would go race. <laughs> like, <laughs> anyway. So oh, you got that fresh blood in there. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's always like two trains of thoughts when you're talking about doping. Are you actually, are you systematically, there, there's three trains of thought. Are you systematically doping to schedule yourself to use your clean urine on the day you actually test in the cup? Okay, that would be the microdosing that we saw at the beginning of the documentary with Gregory. Um, are you destroying evidence, i.e. Lance Armstrong blood transfusion or KGB piss running scenario, or you do it the old fashioned way where you just take a stack of money to somebody and say, this never happened. It was all a bad dream. Slash threaten somebody that, you know, <laughs> yeah. some sort of crime. Yes. So there is the, like, the, that's the basic ins and outs of Icarus and the basic X's and O's of the documentary. Um, now let's get to the good shit. Okay. So that's 30 minutes of framework followed by the next six hours of discussion. Dan, I'll start with you. Okay. And at any point you realize we left something out in terms of the tactics and the doping, feel free, stop, you know, hop right back in. But do you like Gregory? I love him. Like, that dude is just a character. It's like the, the, like, number one, the personality of him. He's just, like, the insane sort of, like, yeah, like, we're already over here. This is what we're doing to pass the test. Like, I'm a total, like, cheater. And just, like, not, just, like, no, just, like, there is no hiding it. Right? He's not trying to be shady. He's not trying to lie to your face, like, unless you're, like, the authority. He's just, he's just very upfront with Brian, and he's very honest with Brian. Sure. And, and I think that's probably like the most like uh, redeeming quality about it. It's like there is a, there is no hiding, and like he he is he's basically a mastermind, and like he has fun with it. And like to think like somebody at that level who's doing that level of uh, cheating is having fun and like like loving the process is just kind of an insane thing to think. Absolutely <laughs> nuts. Jess, your personal thoughts on Gregory? You want him dead? No, I think I think it's great. I think I agree with everything that Dan says, and his like Dan said, his upfront you know personality is like his redeeming quality. He lets people know right away, like, hey, you know, this is what we're gonna do. This is what could happen. But at the same time, like, it's all on you at the end of the day. Like, he actually, you know, asked Brian several times, like, are you sure you want to go through with this? He doesn't just say like, oh yes, you know, let me take the reins and take control. But at the same time, like, you know, Brian does have the support staff he's working with, you know, the guy that he's getting um, the testosterone replacement from, he's working with an exercise physiologist. Both those guys think Gregory's crazy, but at the same time, like, when Gregory, when they meet Gregory, they're like, oh, this guy's like pretty upfront. He's not going to like do you harm. It's just a matter of like, all right, you know, what's the ethical problems when it comes to cheating? Exactly. It's, in it's interesting to see that even the... Like the like the Americans that are involved in WADA, um, in USADA, they really like Gregory. Mm -hmm. They think they, he's questionable because again, right, they're like, like mm. and they're like, oh, you know what? We don't want to say any bad shit about him, so you're just gonna have to talk to him yourself, right? Yeah. And to me, that's a sign that they really they really do like him and respect him to some mm -hmm. to a large degree, actually. Um, he's obviously a, a very intelligent person. I think that one thing that was really interesting for Gregory was. 
throughout the documentary, and this has to be Brian, the guy making the film, could not have known this prior to meeting him. But Gregory reference, references George Orwell's book, 1984, a handful of times. And in that book, first of all, the book was banned from Russia, all right? Like, the no fly zone, it was a no read zone. Like, you read this thing, KGB's cutting off your hands, okay? Now, it's no longer banned, but for those of you that haven't, haven't read it, it is basically, uh, the setting is a dystopia, okay? So, uh, the original book titled Utopia was written I want to say 15, 1600s, and the actual, um, I believe like the Latin meaning, it was something like land that doesn't exist or some shit like that. So the dystopia is kind of the opposite of what we think of when we use the word utopia. And there are three megastates represented, represented, represented. There's three of them, okay? Um, we got six there's, hours left. Yeah, only <laughs> six more. <laughs> better than six hours tight. So, it, anyway, the three states represented East Asia. Can you imagine who that reflects? No. China. Okay. Eurasia. Good guess. Can you imagine who that reflects? Russia. Ding, 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 ding. Dramatic uh, pause. Yeah. And Oceania. Can you imagine who that reflects? The United States. Correct. And in this book, hence why it's banned, uh, Eurasia is, um, it's just a totalitarian government and they 100% discourage free thinking, right? And Gregory, Gregory references this book over and over again and I can't help but feel like, to some degree, his oppression, right? And his being a product of the environment that the, cult, the culture of Russia, right? Like he's not... In it, in sports in general, like it, there's always this pull and this play on morality, okay, which is fucked, in my opinion, because morality can only be determined by the individual, right? And and you have these larger morality views, uh, and in play, culturally, right? So there's a large like morality alignments in Russia align a certain way, China in another way, U.S. in another way. And you see this play out over and over and over again on the world stage in sports, okay? Recently, the U.S., we have this, we have this feeling that we have a superior moral code. We know what's right and wrong. We're the world police. We execute on that daily, right? Okay? Russia, they might have this morality that, you know what? Human nature is human nature. We've been killing people since the beginning of time. Hierarchy's hierarchy. It's not going anywhere. Let's accept it. All right? Or a little lighter-hearted example. A lot of those dudes, when they're out of the country, they don't care that they're married. Right? And, it's, and it's, it's culturally acceptable. And I've heard this and witnessed it on more than one occasion. Right? Uh, and if it's what you do, it's what you it's, do. Exactly. And that's in, in, first of all, just... I pass judgment on nobody. I, like what you do is what you do. Like if it affects me, I'll move. If it doesn't, eh. okay. So, but it's just it's real interesting that Gregory kind of pulls on this on this book over and over again, and it really is like a an overlapping or overarching um, just ideology that he's trapped in with his job, right? Like he needs he's performing for the state. He's executing on a job that is culturally acceptable. Okay, if you go back, Gregory was in a mental hospital. Okay, he was pulled out of that hospital by Mutko, which was ordered by Putin. And basically, well, they wasn't even a prison. Well, he went to jail. And yeah, then kind of. It's it's then he went to the mental institution. Yeah, it's in my my understanding of it is one and the same. Right. Okay. But I mean, basically, he was he was basically convicted of a crime. Yes. Uh, maybe the crime of trying to kill himself. Like it's some it's some shit like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he's you know he obviously has this inner tur turmoil, and they get him out of there. Your charges are dropped. Come work for us. Not only does he get out of jail, he gets out of jail, and gets a high paying job. Okay. So he has a he has a job that's state sponsored, 
And the, the shocking thing about it is he feels this need uh, like to do what's right. Uh, he wants to, he wants to kind of come clean about doping because he sees like the world view of it. But Russia doesn't give a shit about the world view of it. They care about their view of it, which is, oh, now you broke one of our moral codes, which is keep your fucking mouth shut. So now you're going to die. That is one thing they do care about. They care about Communication. Yeah. It, 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 it's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, and so he essentially risks his life. And he's in, he's in witness protection now. Like he's in hiding in the U.S. Okay. Um, just the two of the other three guys he worked with are dead. Okay. One of them was younger than him, recently married, died of an apparent heart attack, which is what, or from a, uh, a previous heart condition, which is what the U.S. or the uh, Russian press said. Yeah. Gregory will tell you that guy had no heart condition. Okay. He was and, a- yeah, well, it's amazing, Dan. There's like certain things you can get injected with that just make your heart beat really fast and you'll die. Okay, like it, it, how people on our side of the world don't comprehend this always blows my mind. Like their their it's level, of, that. yeah, their level of naivete just it's just it's crazy. Okay, so from that standpoint, like I really feel like the man is in a rock and a hard place, you know, and he keeps quoting Orwell. You know, he uses the quote, when it, uh, we will meet each other where there is no darkness, right? Like he's just, he's, he is trapped. Like he wants out. And it's almost like he's having this inner play, this inner fight with himself the whole time. So like, you know, I feel for him. And when Brian goes and meets with, he met with, I don't remember if it was the IOC board or whatever. And the lady, the lady on the board is kind of like getting shitty. She's like, you think I like being embarrassed and like, kind of like, Dressing them down, and Brian's like, "Whoa, well, let's keep in mind here. This dude's about to get killed, you know." So, kind of the the world and global perspective on it. Jess, question, question. So, so, take me through the process of fair play in soccer. In soccer, all right. So. Essentially, the idea of fair play is that if your team commits a foul or does something that undermines, like, the quote-unquote spirit of the games or the other team, um, you're supposed to let the other team, uh, you know, start off where they left off. So a good example is, let's say um, someone... Someone scores, or let's say someone gets tackled, and the ref doesn't call um, call the foul, but the team knows that it was a pretty malicious tackle that um, it might have stopped like a counter attack, and the referee totally missed it. Um, they would essentially kick the ball out of bounds uh, so that that player could receive medical attention, and then once that player is moved off the the pitch. They throw the ball, like they restart play, but then they give the ball back to the team that was attacked. Does that happen? Yes, very often. Okay. Sometimes it doesn't, and you'll definitely hear the jeers and the crowd so, will get, get mad, but 90% of the time it does happen. So is there a code amongst the thieves? These things are acceptable, these things are not. Yes. I, I think it's pretty, like, I mean, you grow up watching it, and uh, you see it at the professional level, but then it's something that's kind of just instilled as you play where like the coach, your coach might say, Hey, you know, give the ball back to the other team. They, you know, stop their advance because one of our players was seriously injured. Therefore they deserve the ball. So usually what'll happen is if you're, if one team is in the attacking third and someone gets injured on a play and it's like a pretty horrific injury where like medical staff needs to come out, that team that's on the attack will kick the ball out of bounds and the other team's defensive third. And that team will then kick the ball back to the attacking team and their defensive third. So, so let me ask you this, Jess. If you were you, you were a junior world USA soccer player or whatever, right? You kick the ball around a lot. Mm-hmm. You're a young man. You're trying to make the U.S. national team. The, you guys go over and play old Russia in a friendly, as they say. I think they, they say that soccer, don't yes. they? And those dudes are just shoving, well, he played goalie. They're kicking the ball so hard, it's 
blowing your arm off and going in the net. I don't know. Yeah, some some extreme example. Basically, they're kicking the shit out of you, and you suspect you suspect it's it's uh, based on doping. Does that really impact your future? I don't think so. I mean, that's that's a tough question because if let's say you've already made it to the pinnacle of your career, right? Let's say you're you made the national team, and that's like the highlight of your career because you know that winning like a championship is a team sport versus an individual sport. Um, yes, it kind of is something that can affect you if you are trying to make that team. If you're trying to make a team and you know that everyone's doping or your competition's doping and they're going to get selected over you, then yeah, it's, it's definitely going to impact your career. But at the same time, if you are competing on a team and your team loses as a team versus, you know, one person, I definitely think that it's not going to be as impactful because if everyone has the same belief that, hey, this team is doping or they play dirty, um, other teams are going to hold that same feeling. But it's different, I think, in an individual standpoint versus a team standpoint. It, DG, was, was Russia prominent in rowing? At all? Um, they had a couple boats. So there's actually a post about this. I tried to find it, but I couldn't. But they had a couple boats that went to, that would have gone to Rio. Got it. But they got it, popped. Was this just a late emergence for them in the sport? No, I mean, they've, had, they've always been decent. Yeah, I mean, they've always been decent in, in certain in certain boats, in certain, like, in certain levels, right? So, like, it's not a huge team, but they, I believe it was the, it was the men's quad. I, I believe it was the men's quad or the men's no no it's definitely the men's quad that I believe sure. was they actually qualified at one of the World Cups leading up to Rio or, or no sorry so Russia qualified over the U.S. right and then those athletes were part of the part of the doping program and they banned Russia but they did not but. I believe they did not bump the U.S. into the qualifying they spot. They just took somebody out and put somebody in. Well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, they just removed that person in front, or they removed that boat from the field, which is, which in my mind, that would be a situation where, like, I'm like, you'd be really pissed. Yeah. You'd be extremely pissed because on that day, like, you know, like with all the factors involved, right, in terms of, you know, like, you racing and, like, the weather or the water, you know, like, on that day, you were beat by somebody with a... Uh, physical edge that was not allowed, like you know, like at that level. Yeah. So, you know, like and like they tested and like they tested positive, and it was more than one guy in the boat. So I, you know, it's not a, you know, that's it's not, not a one fair. off, right? Maybe. Right. And I and I think probably for for sports that are more team based, that are less, that have a higher that have a probability, higher uh, probability, of, or like have a higher skill level as a team as far as like a strategy right so like in like maybe maybe in soccer like it's like maybe like in shooting or archery right like you know like it's like like you take drugs and your muscles are stronger like you're going to squeeze the trigger harder right. like right you know there are things well, that are less they're probably less prominent but maybe it's something like a biathlon of course you, you know like you would see that um but in uh, like a team sport with a high amount of skill and like a situational problem, like you're not gonna, like it's probably harder to spot yeah. than in a than the weightlifting, right? Right, in a rowing, in, in like a running, like any sort of running or athletic event, or like uh, throws is a big one that I think people probably point out yeah. the most besides weightlifting because you're like, I mean, there is a high level of skill involved, but the raw power output For is sure. probably. A bigger index in that total equation. Yeah, I think that's pretty. That's a great point. I mean, if you look at the sports that they did really well at, they noti noticeably doped. You know, things that could be affected by large amounts of strength and endurance, i.e., the longer distance road races, cycling, cycling, running, probably the longer bobsled, racing. bobsled, which is a high sprint power output. Um, Drivers but, don't have to be that big. Yeah, weightlifting, obviously. Um, but because I, I thought about it from this, the same aspect, but I was like, okay, would a gymnast really benefit, like really benefit from doing drugs? There's such a high skill component to it. I don't know that they would. One thing that I wanted to throw out there I thought was really interesting. Okay, so the U.S. has come claimed 
basically to be drug free sport, i.e., not have a systematic doping approach. Of course, we have one offs and shit like that, people that test positive. Um, and there had been Kendrick Ferris, just to name names, had claimed that if the rest of the world was clean, he would be a top so and so uh, finisher. And he always claimed that if he could add 20% to his list, he would be a world contender. I thought 20%, that's a lot. And then Gregory, in one of the documentaries, said you should see a 15 to 20% improvement on the elite level. And so I was like, damn. So that takes Ilya's. And, and, and so think about in weightlifting, think about it. There's a couple things specifically. If you can make technical improvements, get large uh, improvements in, in uh, kilos on your total, right? So if, you, if you're really strong and you have bad technique, you can get away with more. But if you really dial in your technique, you'll start seeing these huge jumps. But what if you're really strong and have really good technique? You okay? You're really strong. You have really good technique, and you're on steroids. You are now Ilya. Okay, a twenty percent increase on Ilya takes his two forty two down to two twenty something, right? Yeah. Which is a good lift. Which is which is you know for that like for that class it's pretty right pretty uh, competitive right. But it's not the best. It's not a two forty two, right? And think about it. When, I don't remember what Kendrick's uh, best lifts were in as an eighty five. But let's say as a ninety four, he did like a two twelve. Okay, and then let's say that the the you know, and I'm talking paper journal here, but let's say that. You know the tops in there are two twenty. I mean that puts him like basically what I'm saying is that puts him within striking distance of the legit top in the world. Okay, and obviously Kendrick's top in the world. He's you know got invited to the Olympics about three damn times. I and mean, that's top in the world. But we're talking like the the upper 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 echelon, the medal contenders in the Olympics. Well, you know like you know like uh, Brian kind of pointed out right. There were the guys that were there. Yeah. And then there were like five to six guys that were on that next level. Yeah. So it's like how do you how do you become one of those, you know, five to six guys. Yeah. For sure. And actually, uh, Paige and I were talking about this earlier with uh, Glenna that, you know, you look at like Big Toddy, she snatches 150. And it's like she's a great example of someone that like has good technique, is strong, and then is probably also <laughs> on something. So it's like, you know, just taking the drugs alone aren't going to get you a gold medal. It's like Absolutely. you still have to be. Absolutely. They always make that joke. It's like, you know, hard work always beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. But it's like, you know, when talent works hard and is juiced up, it's, it's tough to be. Like, yeah, it's yeah, almost it's untouchable. pretty damn hard to be. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that to allude to an earlier point that Gregory made in the documentary that, you know, is probably not getting discussed. And this goes back to, to when he was talking to Brian. First of all, he made a wonderful quote. Wonderful quote. Um, oh, my gosh. And of course, I can't. Can't repeat it verbatim, but he, uh, I know I wrote it down here somewhere, somewhere. He was, um, said like, uh, like you're, you're now haunted by your ideas, right? Because he has this idea that he can take his like performance to the next level with these drugs. Um, so it's going to torment him. Exactly. Exactly. Dude, that's why I really like Gregory's a deep dude. Like I, I really, he's. That month, that, that dude was dropping like some, some legit one liners in there. You know, I love one. Yeah, but, um, but I mean, like, you think he's been in that lab for 15 years. Longer than that. Right? 15, 20 84, years. 85. Okay, so 20, 26 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Roughly. And and he's been basically testing piss. <laughs> you you know? got to read some books or something. <laughs> right. I'm like, Once in got, a band. Like, I'm like, you got to have some thoughts yeah. while you're sitting in there in the lab and you're testing piss and you're trying to, like, figure out the ultimate... Things you're trying to figure out, like the ultimate solution to human physiology, right? Yeah, like just somebody Great. passing the test. Like I feel like Brian's like physiologist, right? He has a great like physiologist to help him, but like you know, like if that guy's not used to working with people that are doping, it's like he's just like, yeah, just keep going, right. just keep going faster, let's do more, right? It's like like that's a scenario where you would have to be in that situation for like twenty something years right. to really learn, like. How much can you exactly push somebody, you know, when they're in that situation and like based on their dosage? Like that's some serious thoughts, some serious science. So that's what I was going to go back to. I the, about the the talent and working hard thing. It's not only just, uh, you know, Big Toddy for example. Not only 
is she training hard, working hard, mastering her technique? But she's been in that systematic approach for years. Okay, so if you – and again, I, another thing that I thought was neat was the dosages and the stuff that Brian were doing were not like – bodybuilding.com forum right. dosages yeah. of, like it was very low like, you know, but it was a it, systematic approach exactly right? so like, I mean, you're not the bros that are hitting up the you know give me like three cc's in a shot no and then more is better no and and i think this this also goes into like um the russian culture and understanding of things like they didn't have mark mcguire belting home runs in this like huge negative connotation that comes with steroid use they just had it as an acceptable part of sport. There's no secrets in it. Like, they all know that they all are doing it, right? And they have it constructed in their mind where it's not a moral... They're obligated morally to do it, to win a medal for the motherland, right? They, I mean, that's a great sense of pride for them. A hundred percent. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree or accept doping or cheating. I'm just asking that you understand their perspective, right? And then also understand their perspective of fear, okay? And this is this is coming from the State Department. This is coming from Putin now, okay? So Mutko, who is their minister of sport, Gregory says, is a KGB man, okay? And for those of you that don't know what the KGB is, was, okay, it's now – called the FBS, not the FSB. FSB, not the football bowl system, um, the FSB. And basically, <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's basically, so I had to like, I didn't want to misspeak, so I, I researched this the best that I could, and my understanding is it's somewhere between the CIA, special forces, and the mafia, right? They essentially are, are not punishable for the things that they do they operate in the shadows and at a very high level sometimes in the shadows i guess i should say a lot of times they want themselves to be known because it's a threat so if you go to work like think if the structure were to change in in uh, at the usoc and all of a sudden i'll use him for an example because he's popular and people know or knew of him Let's say that Al Capone, or somebody more recent, John Gotti, is now the head of the USOC, all right? And John Gotti is going to recruit, like, the Sopranos cast as the the uh, the USA Weightlifting Director, the USA Rowing Director, the USA Track and Field Director. And that message gets carried on for years, and years since before the 80s, and years and years and years. So generations are born into it. Well, what is the outlook on sport? It's not the same as people in the U.S. that are like, let's have fair play. Right? It's different. It's also a matter of life and death. They will kill you. And it's also a matter of getting paid. So one thing that they, uh, they didn't show, again, we're still talking about piss. All right? Um, in the, basically, Icarus is Wayne's World 2. And how Russia makes winners is Wayne's World 1. Okay, and I strongly suggest you YouTube how Russia makes winners German documentary just to find it or whatever. Yeah, if you haven't seen Wayne's World, yeah, go see Wayne's World one. Pause and go do it right yeah. now. Dude, watch Wayne's World one, then follow it up with Russia, how Russia makes winners. Um, but in how Russia makes winners, they get into the good old fashioned bribes where there there's a girl that runs, and this you know brings into question like, yeah, old USA is a uh, Moral uh, compass, I guess. But there's a girl that tests positive. Um, I'm not sure if it was WADA or USADA. I'm going to assume it's WADA. Test at the Chicago Marathon where this Russian chick won it. And then she won She won, the, won it at the track and field worlds as well. And she tested positive. And basically, uh, they notified her via letter. And they said, guess what? All this can go away. At the low, low, low cost of 150,000 euros. Okay, now, what does she do? Wires them the money. Okay? A few months go by, they tell her, sleep easy at night. You know, that's her big thing. Don't stress about this. Call her up. We got a problem. You've uh, Somebody else has a hold of this positive test. But 
we can make it go away. So, and they pay it again to the point of this couple had shelled out $600,000 get positive tests to go away, okay? So then, this is what I love the most. She gets suspended after spending 600 grand to make this not, to make this go away, okay? So as you can imagine, she's a little pissed. She wants her money back. Yeah. And the, it's really hard when you, no matter what you do, like, a good friend of mine once said, he, he helped me out when I was in a little bit of a sticky spot. And he said, we're not going to go into how sticky, any, yeah, how sticky, it was, it was some dirt. Anyway, he said, hey, it's pretty hard to get your money back once you give it to the hooker. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. To this girl, <laughs> Mutko and the boys said, "Stick it! You got a problem? Take it over with that KGB guy over there. He'll help you get your money back." So, actually, to appease her, and only my my uh, only because she kept electronic transaction records, uh, they refunded her about half of her money. So she essentially paid three hundred thousand dollars to test positive, <laughs> right? Um, but. The point that I thought this illustrated more than anything was how much money this chick made running track. <laughs> she can pay out six hundred grand in bribes. Like, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's a lot of money. But I mean, if you're the but I'm like if you're winning medals for Russia, right? I'm like you're a celebrity in that country. For sure. You know, it's like wasn't like uh, like I think like there was a time where Klokov was on like a like some sort of Russian like game show. Dancing with the Stars type Probably. of thing, right? Probably. You know, like you won a couple medals, medals, right? Yeah, yeah you know, being we'll a be super jacked. Right? It, it was a diving contest yeah, of some right, sort, right? Yeah, right, a diving contest. Yeah, by right. Ryan's green. You you know. Dive into a pool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, well, so, their, and their state sponsor structure is such that once you make a national team, you get, a, you get basically a, a set money for the rest of your life and a pension. Okay, so you're going to get X, Y, Z amount of money while you're competing. Um, you're going to get bonuses and shit if you win. And in a lot of instances, they'll they'll give you a house or something like that. And I didn't really understand the um, the implications of owning a home in Russia. Apparently, you it's not like here at the U.S. where you just go get a mortgage. This shit's all owned by the state. So basically. It'd be, it'd be like basically Donald Donald Trump now owns you know your mortgage. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Okay, the the guy at the top that makes all the rules, he also gets to tell you how much you're going to pay a month. And if he wants you to live there, if he doesn't want you to live there, he's going to tell you where to move. Okay, so so it's but, not really your house. No, 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 not at all. But some of these guys get houses and cars and shit like that and make a really nice life uh, for themselves. The other thing that I thought was uh, was interesting the the how Russia makes winners documentary. Well, first of all, in that, oh God, not to take a total detour here, but that movie is basically about a guy that's working for Rusada. He falls in love with an 800 meter runner who's just kicking ass all over the course. And uh, they fall in love, ultimately get married. And then she's like, hey, you want to know how I was so good? All those tests you gave me? I just <laughs> cheated right by him. You know, it's like, it's like the master of deceit, right? Uh, and so this guy's like, how? And then she lays it out for him. Basically, you're just a pawn collecting a, a cup of my piss, and you have no say in this whatsoever. Once again, yeah, centered around piss. This is all, it's amazing. Like All this money is exchanging hands for about an mm, ounce and a half, two ounces of piss. I can give you two ounces of piss right now. <laughs> two ounces of piss later. Like How much is it worth? Uh, so like the, like the, that level of finance is changing hands extremely high in other countries. And I thought, surely if this much money is exchanging hands at their, their national, their like Russia national championships, those stadiums must be sold out. And then I looked and they're not, I, I would venture to say U S track and field has more people attending their national championships than Russia at college level. But, but what is different I believe Russia puts it on TV, like yeah, TV. not and not like, like the Ocho. On, I'm not talking like you know 
It's on your Russian sport. Sports One. It's on the channel that they are putting in your living room and forcing you to watch. Right? Mm-hmm. It's on that channel. It's on channel one out of six. Yeah. The other five are blacked out. <laughs> you, know. you watch. Uh, you, you, watch. you watch this. Uh, so, but the the amount of money, and then so you're like, okay, well, why would or how would you know the, these level of bribes occur? Okay, so if you have money circulating that's at that high dollar amount, all right, then there's they're going to happen one of two ways. The dollar amount is just going to be so damn high that somebody's going to take it. Okay, so look. We all want to p- uh, pretend that we have this great moral compass. But if I'm, you know, living off the government salary of $60,000 a year working for WADA and just running cups of piss all around, and this athlete comes to me and says, hey, let me swap out a clean cup of piss. I'll give you two hundred grand in cash, our little secret. It's going to be hard to say no, right? And the other thing that really impresses me about Russian bribery it's the amount of follow through. Like these dudes pay. Like they are money is exchanging hands. This is not like haha, I got you, and then the KGB guy comes and kills you. That's not that either. But uh, so they like they, they do do that. And then the other aspect of it is is if you're if you're Gregory in this case, and you're like the head of all of Rusada, and the president of your state, i.e. Vladimir Putin, says, We are going to win Sochi. We are going to drug and dope as hardcore as we can. You know that you are the last bastion between that goal and, and making President Putin happy. And there's two, three, four, five, six, however many KGB guys who've been standing outside of your laboratory door for a month on end just scouting at you. You'd be pretty highly motivated to make sure that you follow through on those goals. You're going to do what they say. Absolutely. That's basically, there's no other choice. Yeah. And there's, there's it. No. And Russia seems to operate on this, this notion that it's all around plausible deniability, but it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And they do just enough to make you think, ah, maybe not. Like, and, you, and because you're good natured, you're human, you kind of want to believe them, right? Maybe they're not state-sponsored doping. Why would the director of sport ministry cheat? Well, I didn't know the director of sport ministry was a KGB guy, right? I mean, it's like, once you start piecing it together, you see all the, like, links in the chain of success and, like, where it can be infiltrated to be, you know, corrupt and things like that. And it turns out they all are from the, from the top. Right. Well, except for the guy that's collecting piss samples and falling in love with the distance runner. Right. <clears throat> the guy who arguably, you know, in any good crime, the guy, the guy that always, like, blows the cover or rats him out is the guy that they didn't pay enough to. Right? The, the guy collecting the, piss, the cup of piss needed more money. Let's just be, that's what it is. Right? If you're going to, if you're going to bribe him, bribe him. Don't skimp. Right? I give you some real disturbing analogies right now, but I won't. Moving, uh, moving on. Moving on. So, moving on. Jess, what other thoughts, comments, questions, or concerns you have? No? Much. None? Did we cover thoroughly the Icarus documentary? I think we covered everything. The only question I think that remains is like, what, what now? What now? Oh, I know what we didn't cover. Okay. I meant to bring these in here, by the way. Yes. Um, not to make this all about me, I but mean, it is. We already know it is. Uh, I have read or had read several books, again, back in the, my days of education, centered around like the Olympics and basically um, cheating has been going on forever in some fashion. Like this goes back to dudes that were literally like hitchhiking during the marathon and you know winning the race. You know, not actually. Running, but back then, like, who wanted to watch somebody run 26 miles? Nobody. No one. Well, yeah. you couldn't because the cameras couldn't keep up. Well, it, and there wasn't TV, right? But, uh, I'm not sure electricity was around. Uh, so, anyway, there's this guy, and he's mentioned in the documentary, and I, I have read uh, one of his books, but his name was Richard Pound. 
He goes by Dick, so let's just get it out there. Dick Pound, that is his actual name. He is a Canadian swimmer. I'm, at one point, he was the head of WADA. I don't know if he still is or what that relationship is. I, I didn't look into it for this, but um, basically, he's asked the same question, and he's written about this in his books of, if there's corruption on the WADA level, right, then what next for, for the Olympics? Like, what are we doing, right? We were, the Olympic movement was created to unite nations and basically inspire people to be better humans. And we are not seeing that. Like, that is not happening. So I think that that is the ultimate question of what's next. What, what all gets, you know, there's talk about weightlifting getting kicked out of the Olympics. Well, weightlifting is a small fragment of the cheating that's going on in the I don't know. I don't necessarily have the answers. I know that the the current structure for the Olympic Games can only be upheld if um, wealthy countries hold it. Right. This has been proven time and time again. Right? Just the financial hardship of hosting the games uh, for the country, and it can be reflected in the athletes. We. We've heard the horror stories of the lack of food and quality food that was at the the village for the 2016 games. Um, compare that to something like uh, when was Canelo in London? 2012. 2012. Yeah, he was talking about how it was amazing. Well, yeah, London's not you know setting up their games next to Fafa Vela, right? You know, it's like there's there's plumbing, right. transportation. There's a first world country. Yeah, right. 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 Grocery stores. So, you know, it, you don't do anybody a service when you host in those countries. In fact, it just raises the question about bribery, right? And this goes back to the whole FIFA scandal. The FIFA scandal came to light because there was a secretary that was like blowing the whistle forever before it ever came out. And nobody believed a damn thing she was saying, again, because of plausible deniability, until she said, Cutter is going to get the World Cup. And everyone's like, there's no way in hell Qatar, I believe it was Qatar, wasn't it? Qatar. Qatar. But don't worry, we had this debate about four years ago. Okay, well, Qatar or Qatar, if you're from Qatar. Indiana. I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious. <laughs> don't make fun of me. Uh, they, but anyway, they got the, they got the uh, FIFA World Cup, and that was finally like the... the, the there's no more plausible. Well, I mean, weren't they building like a stadium well, there? Where, you like, think people about were it, dying or something. No, no, no. no, no. You think about it. Um, the World Cup's held every summer, every four years, yeah. and you go Qatar in the middle of summer. Put two and two together. The weather in Qatar is fucking hot, right? And just, so there's just has lived there for a while. <laughs> yeah, but they they pretty mm -hmm. much you pretty much think about building these you know miraculous air conditions uh, air conditioned stadiums, which Kind of unimag like unimaginable in soccer. Like football stadiums aren't even air conditioned. No. They only have like small parts of air conditioning. But you put stadiums in the middle of a desert that are going to be air conditioned, and you start seeing these you know concept drawings, and you're like, this is unbelievable. Like, how is this going to happen? Affordable, unaffordable, and then you start you know tracing uh, tracing the you know. Like, why did this happen? And the next thing you know, you start looking at the money trail. Yeah, for sure. It's in the excuse when like bribery and corruption occurs, and it's like very, very similar to the mafia here, right? Uh, to well, I don't want to get off on a whole nother. I think that's uh, a no, no, <laughs> no. I don't know if I know any mafia. <laughs> yeah, around here, so right? That's probably well, a good thing. Yeah, you don't want to know any mafia right. around here, but. The, the idea has always been <laughs> romanticized to a degree that we're going to take care of our own and we're going to protect our own people, right? And so you don't have to worry about this gang or that gang. We'll take care of you, right? Um, and there was there, – there, that's happening – was happening in the soccer, right? They were saying, yeah, of course, you know, they're bribing us or whatever. But we're going to give them money back later. And they had this elaborate – to me, it looked like a Ponzi scheme, but like depiction of how they were distributing money to countries that didn't have any money. Like, oh, this is how we'll give money to you know, Morocco, or, and it was like, oh, they're they're giving Morocco lots of money. 
but it was coming from like bribes over here and shit like that. I mean, it was a real disaster. And the mafia did the same thing to the fact where the FBI bought into it. Okay, this goes back to Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang, right? The, the FBI let him kill certain people because they, they thought it was greater for the greater culture, for the greater good. Like, that happened. And again, nobody in America wants to believe that like, this is even plausible, but it's the same thing. The same thing is uh, justifiable, like maybe in Russian culture. Okay? It's like, we, yeah, we do some of this stuff, but then we're going to take care of our own. So again, I'm not, I'm not uh, condoning it. I'm just like trying to help you understand their mindset versus our mindset. Right? It's just a different culture. Right, Jess? Yep. Like... The Indian food we eat, that's different. It's not a pizza or a hamburger. All right, gang, I think we have successfully talked this thing to death. That's the best point you've made all day, Dan. Not a pizza, not a hamburger? Nope. Um, do yourselves a favor, watch that documentary I recommended. Watch both of them. Watch both of them. It, Icarus is good. Oh, it, I, I got to give uh, I gotta give it credit, too, on the cinematic production of Icarus is top notch. Like it's it's very good. The when you watch the one on how Russia makes its champions or makes its winners, it's like shot on an iPhone four and uploaded to YouTube, right? I mean, there's there's a different standard of quality. Um, and then I also know that I was very that I was critical of Brian saying like it was almost two different documentaries, but I I don't think he legit set out to have the documentary focusing on the story that with Gregory. I think this happened. Which is pretty organic, and I think it's cool. Um, and I like, I really, really appreciate it from, from that standpoint. It's very good. Anything else, gang? I think that's it. We have a list of seven podcasts, podcast possibilities coming your way. Mm. It's extensively growing. Maybe some guest stars. Maybe some guest stars. We'll see. Talk to you soon.